Welcome everyone to our March webinar. Today we're going to be talking about maximizing the success of, of adoption of the last planner system. My name is Alan Boyku. I'm one of the founders of uh, Niali. And today we have Christian Pickel to continue the discussion that we had last month on the just pardon me here for one second. I have a setting to sort out here. Just having a little technical issue. Today we have Christian Pickel joining us again. We started a conversation with Christian um, last month about the last planner system and today he's going to provide us with some um, insights on being successful in adopting it. Christian's the managing principal of the realignment group and a very experienced coach um, regarding the last planner system. So Christian, welcome. Thank you very much and uh... I got to say, I, I don't look at my biopic that often, but now looking at that next to my Zoom video and judging the amount of gray in my beard, I think I need to update that a little bit. That looks a little outdated at this point. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I'm glad to be back with you. The last, our last conversation was really uh, enlightening, fulfilling, entertaining. It was great. Like, it was, It's fun to do these webinars and just get on here and chat about um, something I'm very passionate about anyway, the last planner system. Um, so I guess as a as a way of a little bit more of a background and intro for our participants, our attendees here today. Um, so I have been in the design and construction world for my entire career. I uh, I did one of these where I, I went to school to be a civil engineer, um, decided when I left school that it was much smarter to go work for a mechanical firm and um, ended up being lucky enough to be at uh, one of the really early adopter. It was a mechanical design build firm that was one of the early adopters of really getting into production management last planner system. So my first introduction to this was in the late 90s, uh, really just working with our own field forces. So how as young project engineers and project managers, we would be supporting our field crews, our field superintendents and foremen with weekly work planning, look ahead planning, those kinds of things. And um, as that progressed through my career, um, later on, I ended up being much more engaged in pre-construction and project development, which led me to healthcare. Um, and also led me back to the East Coast of the US where I was lucky enough to be doing work on a consulting basis for one of the healthcare giants that inherited integrated project delivery and lean construction practices from Sutter, where um, if you've been around lean circles long enough, you've heard the name Sutter Health um, as one of the first uh, or maybe the first integrated form of agreement uh, owners. So I jumped from there to the East Coast and um, I went from consultant to going in-house and working as a project owner. So then I was able to get a lot of experience putting together project teams and really experiencing what it takes to put this last planner stuff and lean construction stuff together from the get-go. So from day one on project delivery, um, as we pull teams together, as we get onboarded with trades. And um, then I was lucky enough to encounter the realignment group, actually bringing them and some of their coaches in on my projects when I was in the healthcare role as lean coaches on some of the things we were doing. And we built a relationship and now here I am. Uh, it's funny how these things work, um, but it's it's been really uh, an interesting sort of career arc to get me into consulting because I, I do lean into having tried to do this stuff for a long time, wearing a, a bunch of different hats before I jumped into the consulting role. And um, I really enjoy that part of it. I really enjoy working with the field forces, working with the foreman out and in the on site and you know going through how is this going to work? How are we going to make it work on this project? And what are the unique challenges? Because every project is different and every project team is different. So it is as much as I think I know you're you're I'm always learning something new every day so with that um why don't we jump into what we're here to talk about yeah, that sounds perfect 
And it's interesting, your background, you've been on both sides of the table, which gives you a, a unique perspective, of course. So what we're going to talk about, we're going to just start with challenges. Like in your mm. experience, you know, there are challenges to adopting anything new. Uh, yep. So that's not, you know, that's not unique to the last planner system. We're going to talk about the human factor as if people matter. And we'll talk about best practices, your intention as a coach, which you go in saying, you know, if we do these things, we're all going to be really successful. And then the really mm. successful ingredients are what really has worked or hasn't. And then, of course, we'll open it to questions and answers, and that'll be through the chat. And I do have one job for the audience today. And that is to take away one thing that ah. you'll either try and adopt or you will tell somebody about. Um, so that's uh, that's your responsibility. So why don't we start with uh, the challenges, Christian, what what you run into and what you what you see in the field? Yeah, they uh, it, you know, it's um, it's a really interesting topic because I work with teams pretty much across the spectrum of procurement mechanisms. So, you know, obviously with my with the background I come from and my IPD experience in the healthcare world, I love when I can jump in with a team that's collaborative, that's been, you know, put together in quote unquote the right way. Um, but um, I work with all of them. So a lot of times I'll get introduced to a project team where a general contractor is trying to implement last planner system and maybe some lean practices, but maybe they're, they don't even really know that much about lean. They're just interested in starting with last planner system. And it, it's a project where every trade has been onboarded through a tough procurement process, like plan and spec, you know, design, bid, build type stuff. And, you know, in, in regardless of what kind of project setup, the stuff isn't necessarily easy. We're, we're overcoming what well, we're, you know, the process on its face could theoretically look easy, but we're trying to implement this process in a team of people where everybody's bringing, you know, not just what it took for them to get to this project and the concerns that they bring about being successful on this project and the mistrust that they bring to this project, but also sort of the legacy baggage of every other job that they've um, that they've done before where things didn't work as planned. So last planner system, you know, is successful when we can communicate with each other transparency, transparently and openly about what is it we need to do? What is it we can do? What is in the way? What do we need to resolve? And there can be a challenge in getting a team to that point, like actually just, you know, unearthing the what what is preventing them from being open and transparent with each other because of you know right. the the baggage that they carry so i think go ahead yeah so that's first day so that's the introduction <laughs> you know construction well, projects typically yeah. you know go over years does yeah. that shift like at what point do you start to say they are practicing the last planner system like yes there's the additional you know the initial challenge mm -hmm. do they overcome them or mm -hmm. do some never overcome mm -hmm. those challenges? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's um, so hopefully they you do overcome that. Um, and it requires quite a bit of leadership. So it's, you know, mm. it's day one. It's really working with the project leadership that is wanting to implement last planner system. Mm. So how how do how do the general contractor, CM superintendents, and managers regard the trade work? Um, what does that what does that communication look like? What does that relationship look like? Um, you know, are we walking the talk, if you will, if we if we bring it's easy to bring people together as a coach in a kickoff and say, let's do this stuff. Let's, you know, work towards being more open and transparent, resolving challenges and bringing issues to the table. But if as soon as you leave the trailer, um, everybody gets a very different message. And if the very first time somebody brings bad news to the trailer, they get a very different outcome and a very different experience. You can imagine, right? I mean, um, we've all been in those conversations. How quickly do we retreat to our safe zone <laughs> and mm. really being guarded with the information we're willing to share? So it can and does change. It requires a lot of work by 
a lot of work and sincerity by the people that are implementing this to really make it change. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it does take a little bit of time. Yeah. And that really, you've moved us naturally into the next topic, which is the human factor and, and mm. the respect for people yeah. um, tenet of the last planner system. And, yep. and you, you've started talking about that. Say more about, you know, the safe zone and, and where people go and how you, how do you maintain that respectful value added culture yeah. that last planner system should develop? And, you know, let's, we could, we could kind of ease into that with there, there's another challenge that really um, I confront a lot in that area. So there's, there's sort of the psychological bit and how we interact with people. But when we're, when we are taking stock of our team of last planners, there's also a discussion about what talent we have in the room, right? Mm -hmm. So, so we're, we're trying to move the planning needle towards this integrated format, towards this collaborative format, towards bringing the planning, the real production planning process closer to where the work is happening. And depending on the kind of project it is, like I do work in the residential, multifamily residential sector as well, you don't always get on-site foremen who are given the information or have had the planning training uh, to really be able to productively participate and make commitments. And I think that ties in with the other question. One is, you know, as the people who are implementing this, you need to want to be aware of this, really take stock of who on your team is able to step in and step up, who needs more coaching and help, and where do you need to have conversations with their shop? Again, in a way that's not going to be threatening to them because, you know, they're in the position they're in because of the way the industry is. But you, you've got to take all these things into consideration and then build that into the conversations. Like, you know, if somebody if somebody comes to the planning table and it's just obvious that they don't have the information, they haven't been given the information from their shop of how long this stuff should take, how many resources they're going to have, or the actual estimate of working hours required to complete their scope of work. How can we expect them to be an effective planner in that scenario? And then the worst thing we could do is then be mad at them for it, right? Blame yeah. blame the victim in the room who didn't have any control over that situation. In terms of safe space, that's a surefire way to get them to retreat and be like, well, I'm just going to sit here and say the least I can possibly say, you know, when I'm asked direct questions. Um, on on the flip side, real quick before your next question, a counter, a counter example, I work with uh, one superintendent who starts every weekly work plan meeting with explaining to his trade with sincerity that he would rather learn that they are coming back one day late than three days early. And taking that to the depths of, you know, variance is variance and being off our planning mark is, is a variance regardless in which direction it goes. And the magnitude of variance is bad either way. Um, you know, that kind of sincerity and repetition of this is really what we're looking for and creating that environment where trades come to speak honestly about what's going on, whether we're, we're a day late or a day early, let's, let's be honest about it either way and learn from it. <clears throat> yeah, it, it's a good point about both the environment and maybe we are partially to blame for that. We use the terms yeah. planners and consultants and we really dehumanize things like maybe you are a head coach and you've got assistant coaches and you have a bunch of professionals that you need going in the right direction akin to a sports team. Yeah. And, you know, maybe that idea, you know, you mentioned the superintendent with with his approach, like all coaches have approaches and mm. and maybe it's uh you know something we can try and do um yeah i think so i mean there's um you know we 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 often because i think it's easier we often talk about the mechanics of how to implement last mm. planner system as a process right. right and um and that's what people ask for that's what people ask us to sell them just come up come up here and do a workshop teach us how to do this and um you know we we often miss the fact that we're so actually you know the the talent issue is one thing um there's another talent issue that i've observed especially recently which is we're we're kind of there's a lot of 
talent being sucked out of the trades into kind of higher up on the org chart organizations, whether that be, right. you know, CMs, owners, uh, EPCMs or whatever the case may be. So we're, we're actually making it worse the way we're shifting the industry rather than bringing trades up in many cases. Um, and we fail often to push hard enough on teaching leadership. Um, mm. You know, this just came up recently. There are some companies out there that really take leadership development seriously for project management, superintendent folks on the trade side, even for foreman and project engineer folks. Um, but a lot of times we don't. And a lot of times we forget when we put a project team together to really do the onboarding of, you know, if I'm if I'm directing traffic, if I'm overall in charge of this project, what kind of leadership am I expecting to see? Are we actually onboarding people to the expectation of how we want you to lead and then giving you the resources to do it in that way? Or is the expectation of a superintendent is a superintendent, a project manager is a project manager. So I'll just fill that gap in the org chart and off you go, do your thing, right? Um, right. And are we are we thinking about those things as we go along? So well, yeah. it sounds it sounds like you are thinking about them, and that that would lead me to the next part of our discussion is, you know, best practices. What is your intention when you go into a project and a team and the things yeah. that should happen? We'll just call them should happen. Speaking of last yeah. planner system, <laughs> we're yeah. into the should here. Yeah, for sure. And I, you know, I do. I will admit here. In my coaching role, you know, there are, I'm going to I'm going to speak to this. I don't know. I don't want to make it sound preachy, but I'm going to speak to this in terms of like. These are best practices that yes. I wish we could follow. Right. Yeah, Depending perfect. on where when I get involved with a project, the ship may have already sailed on some of these things. Right. But I believe I really believe most projects start last planner system way too late. Mm. And there's a couple of things that go into that. One is, you know, we we do, I think there is a perception generally that last planner system is all about trade control and management. Um, and that we need a critical mass of trades on site. I've even been guilty of saying this, like what because by the time I get I get start talking with a construction management team, you know, they're already so far in to the project that what we are worried about is trades being on site and trades starting work. And we want to have our kickoff. And because the way we plan kickoffs, we get right into pull planning. So we want to be close enough to a pull plan being meaningful with work coming up soon that the information doesn't get stale. But, you know, I, I am always teaching and coaching teams to do last planner system on the pre-construction and design as well. Mm. And even if an owner and design team aren't doing last planner, why can't my construction management team start implementing it as soon as my team assembles and do it for all of the things we've got to do to get on site, do it for all of the things we do to get trades onboarded and procured, do it for all of the things that we got to do, you know, to get mobilized and plan our plan of pull plans and all those kinds of things. And, and even if, even if the team that I'm doing pulling together to do last planner is my superintendents, my project managers, maybe some construction administration and pre-con folks put the practice in place, right? Have, ha do my pull plans, do my weekly work plan meetings, do some daily huddles, daily stand on the boards. And then when trades show up, this is just how we operate. So all we've got to do is integrate you now into the system that we've already got in place. So I think, you know, start earlier than you think you need to. Um, patience. Um, there's this other, there's this other um, behavior that I'm constantly coaching around or towards or through and, and kind of working on is that um, we think about the plan as the deliverable or the point. Like we, we just got to get this planning meeting done so we can have a plan on the wall and we can call it done. And <laughs> planning, the planning environment is the point. And so especially as we're beginning, you know, we, we really need to dig deep and find our patience because we're trying to create good planners. We're trying to create a planning system that works for my team. And that may or may not result in a good plan at the beginning, but it's really the work that goes into building that planning environment, which is the most important thing. Um, and so, and I would say those are, those are, those are probably a couple of mine, um, also being really 
two things, maybe two sides of this. One is being really intentional about how we want to initially implement each of the planning conversations, like what tools to use, what visuals to use, how do we make sure they're always front and center and present in where we're working so that they're never out of sight, out of mind. And on the flip side of that, um, the other best practice I think that we do forget about sometimes is none of this stuff is static. Um, mm -hmm. Last planner implementation, like everything else we do on a lean project, you know, we design a starting point, we design a way to kick it off and 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 maybe some standard work around how we begin. But uh, we should be looking for how is this serving us, what's working well, what's not, and and driving continuous improvement in how we implement last planner system as well whether that's changing the format of the meetings or you know changing how we write information on the sticky notes or virtual sticky notes or any of those things right um there there should be ongoing conversations with the team of this is another process by which we're trying to be lean are we actually being successful in that and what information are we able to discover that you know we need to improve upon um yeah th those are a few uh, there, I'm sure there's more out there that I'm forgetting. Well, there is. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah, could, yeah. we could we could talk forever. I mean, you've touched again yeah. on on the environment and the people aspect, and you know, it's the Toyota adage where if everybody comes in with a two second improvement, imagine when yeah. that all gets added up. And that yep. idea, and I, you can talk maybe a little bit about a reticent a reticent participant that just no matter what they are just not behaving yeah <laughs> you know what do you do about something like that because clearly that would be a barrier uh could be a barrier to being successful yeah it can be i mean uh, you know we have um so uh, you know if you if you if you get into some of the team formation and team dynamic readings there's a lot of this stuff out there around you know the the forming norming storming and and all the, you know and and you read some of rex miller's stuff and others about every organization every team will have some early adopters you'll have some of the folks that once they kind of see the light of this is the new way of doing things they're on board but you're go you're always going to have some detractors yeah. and you know you can do all the work you want in terms of showing them the light explaining why it's easier for them if you can actually prove that it's easier for them and show them that that's usually helpful um but there's always going to be some and so what i do is i do a lot of ally building like really take stock of who are my early adopters who are my allies going to be mm. can i can i create a critical mass of team members who get mm. it who want to do it and especially if we get enough of the trade leads on board with this mindset, we're really good at neutralizing our own. So if there's like a trade or one superintendent who's just not really on board, if you got all the other ones, um, they're not really going to find themselves in much of a position to sabotage things. And, yeah, you know, there's peer pressure. There's just, you know, not wanting to be the oddball in the group. And sometimes people self-select themselves out of a team if that's possible too. So, right. you know, th these are all valid things from a teaming point of view that we need to consider and think about for sure. Mm, sounds good. <laughs> now, Diane, yeah. you have a you have a question, Diane, but I'm gonna, just going to hold it. I just want to talk just a few minutes here about sort of those successful ingredients. You just mentioned one, mm -hmm. um, creating a scheme of, of allies and influencers. Um, any other things that um have have worked for you um so it depends and i'm actually i'm reading along in the chat as you're going so i saw the question as well um yeah we'll get to that in a second for sure yeah yeah um so so to me I, this is my approach i you know you you hear this catchphrase a lot of meeting people where they are um mm. you know coaches use that they throw it around and I'm lucky in my coaching approach that, you know, I have enough experience managing design. I have enough experience managing trade work. I have enough experience managing from an owner point of view and even some GC roles and and those kind of things that I can I can approach each conversation with people um, 
in you know from where they are coming from generally i can find the connections in terms of some some tactics i always try to build sort of a a community of practice um within each project team right so so who's who's really taking to this how do we spend more coaching time with the community of practice that's really going to be championing this and leading it how do we look for who we're missing in terms of you know are we really too centralized and too focused on the implementation of this from one point of view like is it is it um all managers is it all superintendents is it all whatever how do we bring more roles into this so we get some diversity um both from a project role point of view and you know from from cultural ethnic gender diversity as well let's get as many perspectives um let's find as many perspectives into that framework as we can and then and then really give that group the tools to start to win others over and and help people do their jobs more effectively mm. mm -hmm. all right perfect why, why don't we get to questions um so diane's asking about last planner during contractor design assist you can see the question yeah there. and she has another one about um tools yeah um in the last planner system so you know that well let me let me take the second one maybe first and i think that really combines with what else does work that we're talking about a little bit but um right. so from a coaching point of view yeah i i have to gauge what other tools to introduce a project team to based on what they're trying to accomplish at a minimum I'm going to onboard everybody to a little bit of an understanding of continuous improvement and seeing and removing the eight wastes, because I want those things to be brought into um, my planning conversations um, and and building some exercises around that. Um, especially, you know, kind of tied to your first question about, um, you know, design assist and and those kinds of things. It's not really an other tool because it is part of Last Planner system, but one of the things that I have, I try to not insist on things as a coach, but sometimes I do. Um, and I've been leaning more into a fundamental insistence that if we're going to do anything leaner last planner system, we must do daily huddles, all hands daily huddles by, by you know, by group of, of working area or whatever the case may be. If it's a very large project, we might have multiple concurrent huddles if people are working in different parts of the building or different parts of the design. And that also connects with Design Last Planner. Like in Design Last Planner, we don't always necessarily do daily huddles. We do it a minimum weekly huddles and check-ins. But I, I am leaning more towards the side of, of complementing Design Last Planner, especially in, in Diane's example of having design assist trades and, and some integration of let's get our whole team organized using Last Planner and my look ahead plan and doing pull planning. And then in an integrated format, we're always going to have small breakout teams that are doing work. Let's within those small teams do daily huddles. We may not need to have a separate commitment log, but let's do like a scrum board where we we basically scrum all of the activities within my small team that we are, you know, turning into commitments that we're bringing back to the next weekly work plan meeting or something like that. So combining um, combining some scrum mentality with last planner system, especially in design and um and um design assist integration of trades is is really big um i think the other part is you know it ties with where we ties in with where we started from kind of uh walking the talk which is we're we're asking people to bring ideas for improvement bring challenges to the table and hopefully solutions and if we are successful in that we have to act pretty quickly to implement them like one of the one of probably the most detrimental things we could do to our project team is launch this stuff, get people to actually open up about what's working, what's not, um, you know, have people do a waste walk or something like that in between weekly work plan meetings and then come back with a report and some ideas for improvement and then nothing changes. You know, if that stuff sits around for two to three weeks um, and nothing has changed, we're going to take away all of that goodwill and all of that improvement very quickly. And, um, and, and you know, we, we want to get folks in there to work together, especially on, 
you know, well, both really in the field, in design assist as well. We need to understand when we are integrating design assist trades, how are we relating to them? Are they design assist partners with an emphasis on the partners? Are they design assist subcontractors? And what are our rules of engagement? Um, and, and and how are we working together? And how are we implementing Last Planner together? What tools are we using? And you know what? How do we make it? I guess easier. Like how do we lower, if you will, the activation energy to get people integrated and working together in the right way? Mm. So. Mm. I don't know. Hopefully, but, um, I give Diane a couple of ideas there for for how how we go about that. Well, that's her job is to get <laughs> one idea from you. Um, so thanks for the questions, uh, mm -hmm. Diane. And on the topic of tools, mm -hmm. in your career, in your time in industry, or even the past five years, did you want to talk a little bit about digital transformation and some of the things you are seeing in in the field about yeah. planning and you know what's working better? or yeah. not uh, some of the needs of the industry, maybe how they're not being met. So that's, you know, on the tool so, <laughs> tool side. We could do a whole nother discussion on this thing, I think. Um, um, so it's so fascinating over the last five years, especially with COVID, right? I mean, COVID mm -hmm. for everybody threw us into a world where all of a sudden we had to do we had to try to do online what we used to do in person. It jump started a bunch of different technology and tools that we didn't, we weren't aware of or didn't know how to use before, whatever the case may be. Um, and now we're trying to reintegrate all this. And um, honestly, like <clears throat> just from <clears throat> a little bit of experience I've had recently on projects, um, I'm I'm kind of worried that we haven't learned enough. Mm. So it, I I I almost feel like we're in a place right now where technology is outpacing our ability to integrate it and adopt it in a really well planned and meaningful way that isn't hurting us. Like I'll give you some examples. I was recently on a project that decided they wanted to go paper free, and um just insufficiently planned how hard it actually is to get a large project team to really collaborate and work together and have structure in a paper free environment we're doing all this stuff with teams we're doing all the stuff with you know that team was doing digital last planner that we're doing all the stuff with um you know trying to use online shared applications but one of the problems I'm seeing is that we're still stuck in thinking about documents. Mm. And so when we try to collaborate, we make a Word document or we make a PowerPoint and then we email it around. And so are we really collaborating? And we try to do digital last planner, but it's really only in front of our faces when we gather everybody into a meeting and stick it up on the screen. And so we're trying to replace some of these in-person interactions where we're used to walking up to the wall or we're used to huddling around a plan table and looking at a drawing together or sticking a drawing up on the wall and marking it up together with these digital replacement tools. And I think it can be done. Um, I, I'm just worried that I see a lot of teams just throw some monitors and computers at it or maybe not even computers, just throw some monitors at it and, and everybody's got laptops and here's a few different apps and there you go, digital transformation complete. So yeah, I think we need to work really hard if, if we're in a hybrid environment, if we're in a digital environment, even if we're in person and using mostly digital tools with screen, what does my meeting room look like? How do I create a digital wall mm. of information that replaces that big room wall? Um, how do I make sure, you know, Another tool that we maybe don't use enough in the design precon world, we talk about 5S, you know, for materials and fabrication and that kind of stuff a, a lot. How 5S is my file system on my project? If I'm mm. if I'm intending people to collaborate, you know, does everybody pretty much immediately know where to go for the right information? Does everybody immediately know where to store something so that other people can find it? 
is are people emailing attachments around or you know do i have does everything digitally have its place and does everybody know where that is you know it's those kinds of questions i think are very important when we talk about digital tools and that kind of transformation as we're getting more and yeah. more especially as we start thinking about vr and what that all brings to our industry yeah vr and ai and etc and and yeah. we've seen, you know, the the notion of thoughtful adoption is probably, mm. you know, a maturity. I mean, five years ago, to your point, there was this outcry that the construction industry are laggards in adopting, you know, <laughs> technology, and everybody knee jerk, like you say, you know, throw monitored, everything at it, <laughs> monitor it up their thing, and now it's like, hold it, things are yeah. better. And I yeah. think to to your point, it's probably you know part of your your coaching and saying you know there is such a thing as source of truth there is such a thing as as timely um you know timely response and notifications and a communication system that everybody's comfortable you know whatever yeah. it is i mean yeah. you make a a good point uh, you know we've seen companies that have done that really well mm -hmm. um and invested in the thought just thinking about our audience here if we have more questions it sounds yeah. like Diane got her idea from you, more okay. than one, so that's awesome. Yeah. Anybody else? Um. You know, I think the other, um, as people are percolating, and if we throw more questions in the chat, I think the, you know, we touched on it a little bit with digital, we touched on it a little bit of what, you know, what sort of practices really work. And making sure this stuff is always really visual, you know, to me, visual management is just one of the fundamental practices in lean and and needs to be part of a fundamental practice in last planner system and there's a lot of different approaches whether it's analog or digital you need to think about it like it has to be that mindful thoughtful implementation but i just had this conversation actually a week or so ago with the team that i was kicking off um you know a lot of teams when they implement last planner system you'll have your planning room whether that's in the trailer um or if you have an office space or something like that and we've got either the wall of monitors or the wall of look ahead plans and pull plans and all that kind of stuff and another thoughtful thing is uh we talk about daily huddles one of the things i've been coaching a lot about lately is to me it's a waste of time to bring people out from the field into the trailer or the office space for a daily huddle you know if i if, if it's supposed to be a 10 15 minute huddle and that means people are arriving on site or they're already out on site and they need to walk five to 10 minutes to get to the trailer. They're probably going to get there a little bit early unless they get, you know, hung up and show up late. They might get a coffee and sit down and, you know, do that kind of thing. And then after the meeting's done, they might hang out for a few more minutes and chit chat and then they go back out in the field. So what's supposed to be a 10, 15 minute huddle turns into a 30 plus minute mm. ordeal. And so, you know, I've really leaned into the preference for a huddle is out where the work's happening, around a GAM box, around a portable huddle wall, whatever the case may be. And so the transportability of my weekly work plan and making sure that's visible out where the huddles are happening. Are my milestones visible out where the work is happening? And are we mm -hmm. thinking about that when we implement last planner system? You know, those and there's different ways of going about it, but um i've started to realize over the years just the criticality of that like always making sure that the most important information is immediately visible and available where i need my folks to see it and you know in the day-to-day -day, what's more important than you know safety stuff weekly work plan stuff that's really you know that really should be our focus in terms of my day-to-day -day operations so are we doing a good enough job getting that out there um along with the other big aha i've had over the years is you know when we make plans one of the big practices is always visual area planning you know we, everybody's if you've been in last planner long enough or even just in construction scheduling you're used to sticking a drawing on the wall or on the screen and drawing the boxes of different colors and labeling it a b c and d or whatever the case may be um and then if i write those down on my weekly work plan can i easily correlate what location i'm in when i'm standing out on the building slab so so all of those visual management practices and routines as i'm out there right 
Yeah, right on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we use the term visual conversations to sort of refer yeah. to that to that mm -hmm. world. We do have uh, another question um, from Diane. How does Last Planner help with build first, build to model? Build first, build to model. That sounds like some kind of a specific terminology. Um, I'm gonna guess at what that means, but is if if I'm getting this wrong then um you correct me and we'll, we'll but i'm assuming this is you know when you're building like a digital twin that's an accurate representation of what you're going to build out in the field yeah so so essentially building so it to, yeah, yeah yeah virtually first i mean so to be honest i think marrying those two up um is a really good approach i was on a large project you know not too long ago that was doing a lot of uh, model integration and was really focused, you know, very tight building, lots of process type stuff. And um, uh, most of the planning sessions began with really doing a deep dive, detailed fly through the model. And one of my wishes for that team is that they actually had started that not doing last planner system after the model was basically built and then using the model to do the production planning, but bringing the production planners into the modeling effort, at least at certain major milestones. And as we are building the model, coordinating the model, understanding how we're going to move equipment in and what needs to be left out and what can be put in, have the people who are going to build it sitting there with the coordinators and the designers so that um, so that that's what we're actually doing. We're essentially building the production plan. Maybe the output's a pull plan, but even if it's not, we're at least doing the production planning while we're coordinating the model so that we're exposing all of the things that that particular team exposed later and using the model in terms of, you know, how difficult and challenging some of the things were to actually install based on the way they were modeled. So that pulls a lot of things in, like you just mentioned with design assist. Right. That means really getting the trades onboarded super early enough in design, making sure they are capable of, of fulfilling that design assist role um, in an ideal world, even having some ownership conversations. You know, the probably the best expression of this I, I've seen is where you can get so integrated that the designers, the engineering does their part where we're really doing, you know, general um, sizing system, PNID type stuff the trades take it from there and do the routing and the coordination. And then we stamp and sign off of the, you know, the trade coordinated drawings as the final field IFCs. That That's sort of the ultimate place we could go with it. And if we have the, the superintendents and foremans as an integral part of that process, essentially creating their pull plans for how they're gonna build it while we're designing and modeling it, um, that would go a long way. The downside is project churn. You know, if you end up with a superintendent that's doing that early work and then they leave the project, then you have another superintendent come in later, then you have a whole bunch of catching up to play uh, to do. But I would say it's still a better model than, you know, dropping people into something that's been designed and coordinated by others. And now we're having to do the work to understand it. So, yeah, yeah I right. think there's a lot of opportunity in that realm of doing that well. Yeah, mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So I am going to bring us to a close. First of all, thank you, wow, audience, for fast. joining us. It was fast. Yeah. We were <laughs> a lot of good things. And Christian, I I got a couple of ideas from you. So awesome. I was successful. Great. <laughs> and if people have questions after the fact, here's Christian's email and my own. And we will, we have recorded this session. We'll be sending this out in short order. So watch for that and feel free to send that around to people. Uh, we will have our next webinar in uh, April, I think third week, and it'll be on big rooms. So look forward to uh, seeing some of you there. And again, Christian, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. It's just so great to hear from somebody with so much experience uh, to just bring stories from, from the field and uh, helping people adopt Last Planner. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Alan. And thanks for come, tuning in, everybody. Appreciate it. All right, everybody. So long. Bye. Right. See you. <laughs>